Number 15. Death House Death House brings together a gamut of the most famous horror legends, including icons D. Wallace, Camille Keaton, Kane Hodder, Bill Moseley, Barbara Crampton, and Tony Todd. In the film, agents are being given an exclusive tour of the Death House, which is a secret prison. Suddenly, the power goes out, and two agents find themselves fighting tooth and nail for their lives, literally, at times. The Death House turns into a labyrinth, as terrifying inmates pursue them around every corner, and while the bloodthirsty prisoners descend upon them, they run headlong into a group of supernatural evil beings in the deepest depths of the labyrinth. Evil beings who are the only thing that might save them from being trapped forevermore in the Death House. If you're into creepy prison horror flicks, put Death House on your to-do list. Number 14. Annabelle 2 In order to delve into Annabelle 2, let's review the first installment. Beginning much like The Conjuring, Annabelle opens with three young people talking to Ed and Lorraine Warren, the renowned demonologists, about their experiences with the haunted doll. The story goes something like this. A young couple, John and Maya, purchase an antique doll for their first child. The first night that the doll is in their house, Maya hears their neighbors being murdered. As she goes to call the cops, a man and woman attack her. The creepy thing is they're holding Annabelle. Before they can do anything, the police arrive, killing the man, while the woman commits suicide, her blood spattering across the doll's face. The two assailants are later identified as Annabelle Higgins and her boyfriend, who are part of a satanic cult. Needless to say, the young couple decides to get rid of the doll. After having the baby, they try to escape the memory of violence by moving to a new apartment, where the doll has turned up mysteriously. As things get weirder, Maya searches high and low to figure out what is going on. With the help of Evelyn, a woman who killed her own daughter on accident, she determines that the doll's evil spirit wants her daughter's soul. After contacting a priest who was attacked by the doll, Maya tries to destroy Annabelle. The demon persuades Maya to sacrifice her own soul instead of her daughter's, but before she can do so, Evelyn springs from the window, sacrificing herself to the demon in order to atone for her own daughter's death. The couple is then able to move on, while the doll is adopted by its new owner, one of the women in the opening scene. Annabelle too takes it from there, as a doll maker and his wife take in some children and a nun after a local orphanage had been shut down. Their own daughter died 20 years prior. However, soon the children aren't safe, even in their new home, as Annabelle, the possessed doll, begins wreaking havoc. Although Annabelle received mixed reviews, it grossed more than $256 million, making this creepy doll series box off his gold. Let's see what else this doll can do. Number 13. Suspiria Suspiria is a remake of a beloved 1977 horror film. The film is about a young ballet dancer who heads to Germany to attend a prestigious dance school, only to find out that there will be no pirouettes involved. Gruesome murders and supernatural happenings are what's really going on across the pond. The ballet student arrives in the dark of night, in a thunderstorm. Not off to a great start. She isn't able to access the academy, but spots a girl named Pat, sprinting from the school grounds, completely terrified. Unable to get into the school, Susie finds a hotel for the night while Pat stays at a friend's place. She tells her friend that she's discovered horrors in the academy and intends to leave in the morning. While in the bathroom, the window calls to her and she peers outside only to find a creepy figure below. She peers closer out the window, to her own determent. A fist smashes through the window pane and strangles her against it. Her friend hears her cries and runs for help, but the culprit in a black coat attacks her viciously, stabbing her near to death. Not finished yet, the killer then throws a noose around her neck and throws her body through stained glass until the rope tightens and finally kills her. Not to be left out, Pat's friend is also mortally wounded from the stained glass and metal that impaled her. And this is just the start of an increasingly bloody film. Despite all the signs, Susie starts at the academy, and all sorts of strange things begin to happen. Susie is medicated with wine, maggots fall from the ceiling, and the school's blind piano player, Daniel, has his throat torn out by his guide dog. What's more is Susie's friend, Sarah, recalls that Pat had been talking oddly before her gruesome death. They start to look for Pat's notes, but someone seems to have stolen them. As they're looking, Susie suddenly falls asleep as Sarah hears footsteps and flees the scene. The footsteps start to chase her and she ends up falling into a mountain of razor wire before having her throat slit. The next day, Susie is told that Sarah has left the academy. Susie contacts a psychologist, Frank Mandel, who is one of Sarah's acquaintances. 
tells Susie that the Academy was founded by a sadistic witch. Colleague of Mandel, Professor Milius, tells her that a coven can only survive with their queen. Upon returning to the school, Susie overhears footsteps and follows them to Headmaster Blank's office. She discovers a hidden passage in which the staff, including Blank, are performing a ritual and planning the death of Susie. Susie turns around and finds her friend, Sarah, nailed to a coffin. She sneaks away, but awakens Helena Marcos, a sadistic witch in the form of a shadowy figure. Helena orders Sarah's corpse to murder Susie, but before she can, Susie stabs Helena in the throat, appearing to kill her. The building begins to collapse, and Susie manages to flee before it goes up in flames. Now that you know the plot of Suspira, are you ready to scare your ballet slippers off with this innocent dance academy flick? Number 12. Resident Evil The Final Chapter The Resident Evil series is loosely based on the Capcom Resident Evil video games. With six sci-fi action horror films under its belt, the narrative may be getting rusty, but it might also surprise us. It's really a hit or miss. But if we decide to give it a chance, what's happened up to this point? The bioengineering pharmaceutical company Umbrella Corporation is the series' bad guy, responsible for producing bioweapons and creating the zombie apocalypse after one of its viruses wiped out the world population. Pitted against Umbrella Corporation is one of the company's own security operatives, Alice. Although she was not in the video game series, other characters in the video game make an appearance, like Chris and Claire Redfield, Jill Valentine and Albert Wesker, among others. Resident Evil, the final chapter, is the sequel to Resident Evil Retribution, and is the final series installment. The 3D science fiction action horror film follows Alice and her friends who face a betrayal. Albert Wesker has brought together all of Umbrella to wipe out the remaining survivors of the apocalypse in one final showdown. What's worse is that Alice has lost her superhuman abilities, making her chances of saving humanity slim. The film's synopsis promises an action-packed battle with undead hordes and new mutant monsters, so this final installment is sure to be one for the books in 2017. Believe it or not, though the reviews consistently pummeled the Resident Evil films with Rotten Tomatoes after chucking a mere 20-30% to 30 approval their way, the film series is the highest grossing of any series based on video games, bringing in a whopping 915 million big ones globally. Resident Evil The Final Chapter has already been released in Japan. Its scheduled release date for the US is January 27th, 2017 in 2D, 3D, and IMAX 3D. Number 11. Friday the 13th This American franchise is a scary movie classic, which has spanned novels, comic books, a TV series, 12 films, and a video game. Most people who hear Friday the 13th have a vision of Jason Voorhees, the masked villain who was a drowning victim at Camp Crystal Lake as a child, resulting in a curse that leads to mass murder. While Jason isn't always the slasher, he is always motivating the murders in the film series, which has grossed more than $464 million globally, despite being unpopular with critics. In the original film, the slasher was not Jason, but rather his mother, Miss Pamela Voorhees. Her motive for stalking and killing teenagers who were reopening Camp Crystal Lake was her son Jason's death, after two staff members were negligent in watching him. Though she manages to murder a number of camp counselors, Miss Voorhees is eventually decapitated with a machete by one of the counselors, Alice Hardy. The second installment reveals Jason as alive and well, and full grown. He returns to avenge his dead mother, taking out Alice and murdering all who venture near Crystal Lake. It isn't until the third film of the series that Jason dons his famed hockey mask after stealing it from a victim to hide his face. While we can't know what this new film might entail, producer Brad Fuller has said that a new origin story will be created for Jason and his mother. Let's hope it involves machetes. Number 10. Halloween Like Friday the 13th, this American horror franchise spans comic books, novels, a video game, and 10 films. Michael Myers, not to be confused with SNL's Mike Myers, is the villain of the film. His evil started in childhood, as he was sent to a sanitarium for murdering his older sister. When he escapes from the sanitarium 15 years later, he decides to spend the rest of his days stalking and murdering the townsfolk of Haddonfield, Illinois, on Halloween. This is the premise for a franchise that has grossed $366 million globally. If the newest is anything like the 1978 original, it will involve a lot of bloodshed. In fact, it may hemorrhage more blood than the entire franchise combined. 
The film's executive producer, John Carpenter, says of the film, 38 years after the original Halloween, I'm going to try to make the 10th sequel the scariest of them all. Let's back up to the last installment of the series. A year has passed since Michael terrorized Laurie Strode. Michael has been presumed dead since last Halloween, but he's still alive in Laurie's dreams. Dr. Loomis, Michael's psychiatrist, takes advantage of his patient's horrifying killing spree to sell some books, and Michael, alive and well, is being met with his own visions of his sister. Deborah, who tells him to bring Lori home. Lori's hallucinations start to imitate Michael's as she starts to mirror his murders. Meanwhile, Dr. Loomis, now touring with his book, is met with public criticism for exploiting the violent deaths and for not helping Michael psychologically when he had the chance. After reading Loomis's book, Lori finds out that she is Michael's forgotten sister, Angel Myers. She attends a party to get away from it all, and at the party, surprise, surprise, Michael shows up and murders her friend, and then one of the brackets with whom Lori is living. While Lori and her friend, Maya, arrive at the house, Michael murders Maya and attacks Lori, who is somehow able to flee and flag down a car. Michael won't stop there, though. He murders the driver, flips the car, and Lori is left unconscious. He is then able to drag her to a shed and finish his mission. As police surround the shed and Dr. Loomis shows up to try to talk Michael down, Lori is now hallucinating that child Michael is pinning her down. In Michael's vision, Deborah then tells him it is time to go. He murders Loomis, but when he steps in front of a window, he's shot to death by Sheriff Brackett. Lori is released from her vision but she walks over to Michael and whispers that she loves him before stabbing him several times. When she exits the shed, she is wearing Michael's mask. In the last scene, Laurie is sitting alone in a psych ward, smiling at Deborah, as the poster reads, family is forever. So we can only hope the Myers are back to slay Halloween in the newest installment. Number nine, Flatliners. This is a sequel remake of one of the creepiest 90s sci-fi psychological horror films, Flatliners. The original had a star-studded cast, Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, Kevin Bacon, and William Baldwin. Sutherland will reprise his original role in this new film, and Ellen Page has also been cast. There's not much out there in the ethers of the internet about what's in store for this sequel, so let's recap what happened in the first episode. The original Flatliners follows Nelson, a medical student who begins his journey with a desire to die. He wants to experience what's beyond death, and so his classmates agree to resuscitate him after he flatlines for one minute, hence the title. The afterlife he experiences while dead is more like a series of visions of the past. He sees a young boy that he bullied when he was young. When he comes to, the others decide that they want to experience the afterlife as well. One of them, Joe, finds himself in a series of erotic episodes. Another, David, also sees a girl he bullied as a child. In the real world, they begin to hallucinate, bringing those images to life. The bully victims become the bullies, beating and taunting their torturers. Joe's future with his fiance is hampered by his unfaithfulness in the form of home videos. Finally, Rachel decides it's her turn to die. David wishes to save her from their shared fate, these terrible hallucinations, but the others have flatlined her before he has a chance to do so. In fact, she almost dies when the power suddenly goes out, but somehow manages to pull through. However, a memory of her father killing himself comes back to haunt her. They all decide that perhaps facing their past will rid them of the haunting hallucinations. David visits the girl he used to taunt and apologizes for his behavior. He feels sweet relief when she accepts his apology. Nelson doesn't have such luck, as his victim attempts to beat him with a climbing axe. Joe too doesn't feel relief as his fiance has discovered his videos and ends it with him. Rachel, however, receives an apology from her father as his ghost appears to her and relieves her guilt about his death. Assumedly, the sequel will follow along the same theme, with medical students choosing to flatline and then being haunted by the resulting visions. We can only guess what horrifying hallucinations are in store in 2017. Number 8, Insidious, Chapter 4. This supernatural horror film is the fourth in the Insidious series. As the title suggests, let's recap with the third film to see where we left off. Elise Rainier, a retired parapsychologist contacts Lilith at the behest of Lilith's daughter, Quinn Brenner. Elise realizes the spirit that they've contacted is not Lilith and tells Quinn not to make any more attempts contacting her. Quinn starts to have visions of a strange figure standing far off, waving at her. Then, suddenly, she is hit by a car and left with her legs in casts. Thereafter, she is stowed away in her father Sean's apartment when the figure starts to haunt her. 
growing more and more violent and eventually flinging Quinn around her bedroom. Sean approaches Elise for help, but she refuses as she knows that venturing into the dark would bring evil spirits with it. But Carl, her friend and fellow parapsychologist, convinces her to use her gift, saying that she is more powerful than any evil spirit. Quinn is now possessed by the demon, and Elise finally agrees to intervene. She enters into the spiritual world and into the further, and with the help from a spirit who is also the demon's victim, she encounters the demon, who is the bride in black that haunts her. She defeats her demon and returns to the real world. Quinn is left to defeat her own demon, and as the demon begins to gain an advantage, Elise tries to bring her back by reading a neighbor's message about a letter from Lilith, Quinn's mother. Lilith then appears to aid Quinn against the demon and return her to the real world as well. At the end of the film, Elise comes out of retirement, but upon returning home, she spots a being staring at her from outside. Elise first thinks it's her dead husband, but then quickly sees that it is a demon. Suddenly, the demon from film one flashes next to her. And cue the goosebumps. What demons are haunting film four? Number seven, Jeepers Creepers 3. Trish Jenner returns, this time a mother of Derry, whom she named after her brother who was killed by the Creeper 23 years prior. She has nightmares about her son meeting the same fate and is determined to destroy the Creeper so it doesn't happen again. With help from Jack Taggart Jr. and Sr., who were burned by the Creeper in the second installment, Trish seeks out the Creeper to take him out once and for all. This is where Jeepers Creepers 3 calls for a recap of the second installment. In it, Billy Taggart is abducted by a scarecrow, while he and Jack Taggart Jr. and Sr. are setting them up in the field. The next day, a bone fragment blows out a school bus tire. Minxie, a cheerleader on the bus, has a vision of the Creeper's first victims, both of whom warn her that he is coming. Another tire is blown out and, as the students stand outside, the Creeper abducts the bus driver and the coaches. They all race toward the bus, but Minxie, along with other students, don't make it there. Minxie passes out and envisions Derry, one of the Creeper's victims, who tells her that every 23rd spring, for 23 days, it emerges from hibernation and hunts for victims, with a mission to replace his own body parts and organs with theirs. The Taggarts investigate what's going on at the school bus after hearing multiple police reports. They reach the students over the radio, and the Creeper continues to attack, severing Dante's head to replace his. While the Creeper is taking more and more victims, Taggart shows up to stab it, while the remaining students shoot it with a harpoon. But before the Creeper dies, it falls back into hibernation. More than two decades later, the Creeper is a mere tourist attraction at Taggart's farm. Teenagers come to gawk at it, but Taggart isn't laughing. He waits with a harpoon gun by his side. Hopefully the third installment will tell us who's laughing now. Number 6. Split M. Night Shyamalan is back after many failed attempts at reinventing the wheel of twist endings as his supernatural horror thriller The Sixth Sense famously mastered. And this time, he just may do it with Split, with stars James McAvoy, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Betty Buckley. Though his 2000 film Unbreakable didn't quite break the box office, Split has been deemed a thematic sequel to the superhero drama thriller. In Split, a teen's birthday party leads to a triple kidnapping in the light of day. Marcia, Claire, and Casey are held captive in a windowless room by their torturer, Kevin, played by James McAvoy. They don't know what to think of their captor, as he seems to have split personalities, acting as a nine-year-old boy one minute, a woman the next, and a paranoid clean freak to boot. Come to find out, Kevin suffers from a disassociative identity disorder that exhibits more than 20 alternate personalities. Each of these personalities is peculiar, but some are more violent than others. Though the captives may be safe for most, who knows what the next personality might bring. The film will be released in North America on January 20th, but pre-screenings and early releases have generated positive reviews, with Rotten Tomatoes giving an approval rating of 81%. The Guardian's Jordan Hoffman rated the film 4 out of 5 stars, calling it a masterful blend of Hitchcock horror and therapy session. Shyamalan is also known for the sci-fi thriller Signs and fantasy thriller Lady in the Water and the fantasy adventure film, The Last Airbender. Number five, World War Z 2. This sequel to the 2013 American action horror film, World War Z, again stars Brad Pitt as Gary Lane, a former UN investigator who circumnavigates the world with a mission to combat the zombie pandemic. The original was criticized for being anticlimactic, but otherwise received favorable reviews and a whopping $540 million grossed worldwide, outstripping all other zombie movies financially. 
To recap, World War Z is brought about through a zombie pandemic that rises up in major world cities. Zombieism is widely contagious, it seems, as those who receive bites are zombies in 12 seconds tops. Gary Lane and his family manage to escape the Philadelphia outbreak, hiding away in Newark, where they are rescued. But before they can get out of the house, unscathed, zombies attack and bite their hosts. The Lanes and their host's son manage to escape in a U.S. Air Force helicopter to an offshore safety area in New York City. After finding that Patient Zero is a South Korean doctor who was bitten by a deranged soldier and turned zombie 10 minutes later, Gary noticed that an injured soldier had been passed over by the attacking zombies. Gary also finds that Israel had reinforced their city walls and North Korea had removed the teeth of all its citizens, both before the outbreak occurred. In Jerusalem, Gary discovers that Israel had found out that the Indian army was fighting the demon and had issued the building of the city walls to protect themselves. But during Gary's visit, Jerusalem is overtaken and he barely reaches a flight to escape the attack. The flight is directed to a Hu facility in Cardiff. As it nears the city, a zombie on the plane attacks and infects many. Gary chucks a grenade to throw the zombies from the cabin and the plane crash lands, leaving only Gary and his protector, Segan, alive. Gary falls into a coma and wakes three days later. He realizes that zombies need a healthy host to attack and ignore the sick and frail, so he recommends injecting oneself with a disease that is curable, but will mask good health from the zombies. As he and some Who scientists venture into the room where the pathogens are kept, zombies attack. Gary is separated from the scientist, and so must inject himself with a pathogen to test his theory. The zombies ignore him, and he escapes with all the pathogens. They come up with a vaccine, a combo of smallpox, meningitis, and H1N1, which works just how it should. Zombies avoid those injected with it. He also finds that when no healthy humans are around, the zombies just stand dormant. In this way, humans can launch an attack, but the world is burning. This is where the first installment leaves off, and presumably where the second installment will begin. Can Jerry and the living launch an attack on the growing army of the Walking Dead? We will see in World War Z 2. Number 4. The Tower of Terror When you think horror films, you probably don't think Disney, so it's safe to say that any Disney horror flick will shock your socks off. Perhaps this one will give you Mickey Mouse nightmares. After Pirates of the Caribbean, Disney hopes to make bank on another of their theme park rides adapted to film. The ride is the famed Tower of Terror. The studio tried it before with an unsuccessful 1997 straight-to-TV movie, but second time's the charm. Maybe. The original flop followed a journalist trying to solve the mystery of some folks disappearing on an elevator midway up to the tip-top club in the Hollywood Tower Hotel. While there isn't much yet out on the new film, Disney has reportedly gone big budget on it, so you might expect a franchise worthy of a second iconic Jack Sparrow-esque type figure. Here's hoping. Number 3. It. If you aren't afraid of clowns already, this remake of Stephen King's It will get you there. Stephen King is known for themes like childhood trauma, traditional small-town values masking darkness and evil, and the power of memory. Considering all of these ingredients, plus a sadistic clown, and you've got yourself a recipe for horror. The book of the same title begins with a child chasing a newspaper boat into a gutter. The boy sees a set of glowing eyes in the darkness. At first, he thinks it's a cat, but a silver clown appears, introducing himself as Pennywise the Dancing Clown and offering him a balloon. When the boy refuses, the clown convinces him to reach for his boat in the drain. That's when he rips his arm off and lets him bleed to death. The story only gets more gruesome from there on out. Kids start disappearing in Derry, one at a time, with only body parts remaining. Seven kids, known as the Loser Club, meet up at the Barons to discuss their encounters with the terrifying clown. In the new film, Mike Honlon brings the group together 27 years later, as it has returned. Kids are vanishing, as are the group's memories. The Seven must remember how to kill Pennywise before he kills them. The thing that's so troubling about it, apart from the whole clown thing, is that the terrifying clown knows its victim's phobias and shapeshifts itself to exploit these fears while it hunts. What makes the prospect of this horror film even more horrifying for those with a clown phobia is that real-life sightings of scary-ass clowns have been reported regularly over the past several months. Starting in August 2016, a nine-year-old boy in South Carolina told his mother that male clowns had tried to entice him to enter the woods. Midway through October, many more sightings had been reported all over the U.S., as well as in 19 other countries. Some suggest that the seeming upsurge in creepy clown sightings may be linked to the release of It, 
perhaps as some publicity ploy, or simply as some creep exploiting the film and getting his jollies from scaring the piss out of everyone. However, some of the clowns do seem serious and even criminal with some incidents involving assaults, robberies, and even violent threats at area schools. Whether it's a publicity stunt or not, most people would likely suggest that these weirdos quit clowning around. If you're that obsessed with psycho clowns, just buy a movie ticket. Number 2. The Dark Tower The Dark Tower is a multi-genre Stephen King book series, a western science fantasy horror film to be exact. Stephen King's book features Roland Deschain, who is the last remaining member of the Gunslingers, a knightly order. As you might expect from the genre description, the society King's characters live in is socially and technologically based on the Old West, but with a fantastical aspect. Although much of the old magic has disappeared, traces remain. Moreover, advanced technology has found amongst the society's relics. The world Roland is living in is falling apart, unorderly time, wars, and regions and cities disappearing. The sun's rising and falling happens at 90 degree angles. To put it mildly, Roland's world is strange. The film is not a direct adaptation of the books, but rather a reinterpretation. In the film, 11-year-old adventurer Jake Chambers finds clues about Midworld, which is in another dimension. He follows these clues and is brought into Midworld, only to meet Roland Duchesne, the Lone Wolf Knight. Roland is on a mission to find the Dark Tower in order to prevent Midworld from becoming extinct, as this end world is the meeting point of time and space. But along the way, the two face unpredictable monsters and a cruel sorcerer who also wants to find the tower so that he can be master of all kingdoms. These obstacles make the mission damn near impossible. Though perhaps not as frightening as other horror films on this list, The Dark Tower is certainly highly anticipated, as production has been ongoing since 2007. We'll see if it was worth the wait. Number 1. Amityville – Awakening This American supernatural horror film is the Amityville series' 18th installment. The film was originally planned to use found footage with a plot involving an ambitious female television news intern on the verge of breaking the most famous haunted house case in the world, who leads a team of journalists, clergymen, and paranormal researchers into an investigation of the bizarre events that will come to be known as the Amityville Horror, only to unwittingly open a door to the unreal that she may never be able to close. This all got scrapped, however, and the plot instead follows three children, Juliet, her comatose twin James, and Belle along with their single mom, Joanne, who all move into a new home together in order to afford James' healthcare. But the house starts showing signs of a haunting as strange things begin to happen. Belle experiences terrible nightmares, while James starts to miraculously recover. Although Joanne tries to keep the fact that they've moved into the infamous Amityville house under wraps, Belle realizes her mother is keeping this secret, and who knows what else. Bob Weinstein says of the film, We are thrilled to return to the mythology of the Amityville horror with a new and terrifying vision that will satisfy our existing fans and also introduce an entirely new audience to this popular haunting phenomenon. Let's hope that it satisfies our sweet scary tooth. 